This happened just a couple weeks ago on a Friday. I had two friends in my car. We were coming back from a restaurant to celebrate finishing up the school play. I'd just dropped the first friend off and was now making the four to five mile drive to my second friend's home. It was down a narrow road that cut through some pretty dense woodlands. She was in the front seat and we were listening to some ballads just talking about life. It was nothing too out of the ordinary. I was driving behind a deep red pickup truck that had a motorcycle stored in the bed. I wasn't tailgating them or anything, even though the driver was going a bit slow for my taste and swerving around just a tad too much. I was about to reach this intersection that's not even a block away from my second friend's home when the guy suddenly pulled over for no reason. He just pulled over to the side of the road, about one or two car lengths from the blinking red light. As I passed him to stop up ahead, I saw his face. He was pretty generic looking, like any guy you'd see out walking on the street, but for some reason, he was staring right at us with fury in his eyes. He was so angry that it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and I sensed something was not right here. My friend looked out the window and asked me, What is he doing? I looked at my rearview mirror, only to see the man getting out of his seat and pulling a ski mask over his face. He was wielding a huge, I'd say 10-inch knife in his hand. He started sprinting towards our car, almost reaching the passenger side. I screamed and slammed on the gas, driving around for a while. To my surprise, I could still see the man trying to chase my car for a few blocks until he knew he was not going to catch us on foot. I went down a few random roads to lose him, and when I got back to the intersection a few minutes later to finally drop my friend off, the man seemed to be long gone. My friend ran inside as soon as I let her out and locked her doors. I sped away from the area, but it was surely terrifying. I told the police and filled out a report as well. I don't think I'll ever be crossing that intersection if I can help it again. My parents were out one night, and my brother and I were home alone. We were probably 10 and 12 years old at that time. I remember there was a knock at the front door, and I heard a voice call out, Pizza's here! I remember initially thinking it was my father playing a joke on us. I instinctively went to open the door, when suddenly it hit me. That wasn't my dad's voice, and we didn't order any pizza either. I said so out loud through the door. There was no reply and no audible movement either. I went to my bathroom window, which allowed some vision of the footpath leading to the front of our property and the front door. You couldn't see the door itself though. Me and my brother waited for about 15 minutes, grabbing a baseball bat and some ornamental fireplace pokers until eventually we saw the guy move away from the door and walk away. It was just some random guy with dark hair and a ponytail. He had a big dark coat on and was covering his face with a mask. There was no pizza in his hands either. One night when I was about seven years old, I went to sleep at around 9.30 and got into the second level of my bunk bed. I soon fell asleep, but I was woken up in the middle of the night to what sounded like someone whispering no repeatedly, as if they were in some deep pain. Thinking I just imagined it, I tried to go back to sleep, but that's when I began to hear the creaking of the wooden boards on the stairs slowly getting louder and that whisper getting louder as well. I knew it couldn't be my parents because they were sleeping in the bed next to mine. Then I heard someone screaming, along with footsteps coming up the stairs, and again the whispering of no over and over. I slowly got out of bed and crept toward the ladder to get to the floor, 
I began to crawl towards the bedroom door in the dark, which had a full view of the stairs. I saw nothing moving in the dark nooks of the stairs, but now I heard the whisper coming from a room upstairs which nobody used. I silently crept toward the stairs, but I kept the lights off and began to creep down them so I could check the front door. Nothing seemed to be out of place. I turned on the living room lights, and that's when I saw it for an instant, the silhouette of three people outside the living room window. As soon as I'd seen them, though, they already fled. I proceeded to turn on every light in the house and wake up my parents to check all the rooms. We didn't find any evidence of anyone inside. I waited for it to be morning so we could check even further, but there was no evidence of anyone having been inside our house. It was such a strange and frightening occurrence. I was 25 and decided to take a trip into the city after my mom's passing. She died very unexpectedly and I still lived with her at the time, so I really needed to get out of that house. Everything inside of it reminded me of her. I chose a hotel that had relatively good reviews, and the price for the room was way too good to pass up. I won't reveal the hotel's name for obvious reasons, the main one being I'm trying to forget this experience altogether, and even typing out its name is hard for me. The hotel had an old world charm to it that instantly drew me in. As I checked in, I couldn't help but admire how clean everything was. It was the kind of place that you see in the postcards, and I was looking forward to getting my room and finally being able to relax after everything I'd been through that month. My room was on the second floor, and it was nice to see that it had a good view of the garden. The hotel staff was friendly and everything seemed perfect. It all started innocently enough. On the first night, I went down to the hotel's restaurant for dinner. As I sat alone at the corner table, I noticed a man at the bar. He was tall with messy hair and a pretty scruffy beard. He seemed to be in his 40s or so and was wearing a faded leather jacket and jeans. I don't know why I remember what he was wearing so well but I do know I caught his eye for a moment and he gave me a nod. I'm a pretty awkward person, so I just looked away and pretended like I hadn't seen anything. The night went on and I tried not to think too much about it. After dinner, I returned to my room and settled in for the night. I watched some TV, read a book, and eventually fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, though, things felt a little off. As I stepped out of my room and made my way towards the elevator, I noticed the exact same man from the night before. He was just leaning against the wall a few feet away from my room. His eyes immediately locked onto me, and it sent a shiver down my spine. It was not the good kind. I tried to shake off this uneasy feeling that I was getting, thinking it must all be a coincidence but that voice in my head was telling me that something was off here. I should have listened to it. I decided to try and go about my day without being too paranoid, but being a woman all by myself and fairly small, paranoia is a bit of a requirement. I wanted to see the sights and explore the city, but no matter where I would go, I had this eerie feeling that someone was following me. I just couldn't escape the feeling of being watched. That night, I got back to the hotel and decided to have dinner in that restaurant again. I really didn't want to run into that dude once more, but the convenience of eating and being able to go straight up to your room was just way too tempting to pass up. I also hoped that being around other people would ease my nerves. As I sat down at my table, the same man walked in once again and sat down at the bar. This time, he was a bit closer though and he was facing me. He had a drink in his hand and was staring at me very intently. I tried not to look at him, but when someone is staring at you so hard and won't stop or even blink when you look back at them, you can't help but take a peek every so often to see if they're continuing to do so. 
After a short while, his face changed into a sort of smile that thoroughly creeped me out. I got up to leave and noticed he got up at the same time and began walking out after me. He was eerily close behind me as he did so. I swear, I could almost feel him breathing on the back of my neck as we walked. I tried asking the man nicely to stand a bit further back, but he just started to laugh. He followed me all the way up to my floor and stopped a few doors down from my room. I entered my room quickly, glancing back at him, and I noticed he was doing the same thing as before, just leaning against the wall clearly waiting for me, or waiting to do something to me, all without saying a single word. I knew I probably shouldn't ignore it anymore. I was scared and confused. I decided to approach the hotel staff about the situation first, before I went so far as to just call the police. The man hadn't actually done anything to physically harm me, so I doubt there was anything they would have been able to do anyway. I explained my discomfort and the fact I had seen the man loitering near my room multiple times, and he seemed to be following me. They were understanding and assured me they would keep an eye on things. For the next couple of days, I stayed close to the hotel and inside my room for the most part. I even considered cutting my trip short, but I didn't want to let fear dictate my choices. This was supposed to be my time to heal, and I didn't want to let some weirdo ruin that. As a person traveling alone, I was determined to reclaim my sense of security. Unfortunately, every day I was there, I saw that guy. Sometimes he would be waiting in the lobby, other times in the hallway, or other times right outside my room. Occasionally, he would be at the restaurant, even managed to show up at the gym the few times I'd randomly decided to work out. It was as if he was playing some twisted game of cat and mouse with me. I became increasingly paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder and wondering when and where he'd appear next. One night after I'd been there for about a week, I returned to my room after dinner and was shocked to find a note had been slipped under the door. The handwriting almost looked like it was hurried and barely legible. All it said was, I was watching you. My heart raced as I read that note over and over again. I knew it had to have come from him. I immediately called the front desk and reported the note to staff, who told me they were taking the situation very seriously. They advised me to lock my door, stay in the room, and wait for them to check the security tapes. They assured me they'd find the man and get police involved if necessary. I sat in my room, waiting anxiously for anyone to tell me the man had been kicked out or even that he'd been arrested. That I'd be okay somehow. Minutes turned into hours and the sense of dread only intensified. What if the staff couldn't find the guy? What if he was waiting for me somewhere in the hotel? What if he was in my room? I just didn't know. It almost felt like I was being hunted. Finally, a knock at my door broke the silence. It was the hotel manager, along with the security guard. They informed me they had found the man and was in the process of being escorted off the premises. They assured me that he would not be allowed back into the hotel and that they were involving the police to be sure all necessary steps were being taken to resolve the issue. I was relieved but still a bit shaken up. I thanked the hotel staff for their quick response and for believing me when I told them something was wrong. I was later contacted by a detective who informed me the man had been arrested after they found many pictures of me in his coat pockets. It turned out the man had been stalking me for almost a year without me ever knowing. They investigated his apartment and it was filled with pictures of me out on town, pictures of me doing everyday things. There were even candid shots of me at my mother's funeral, pictures of me in my house taken through my windows. I have no idea how I never noticed that someone was constantly following me. I guess realizing when I did, before he tried to do anything to hurt me, was better than realizing too late. He was charged with aggravated stalking. Looking back, this experience taught me the importance of trusting my instincts and taking action when I feel unsafe.
I'm a 22-year-old woman who currently lives with my family, along with my current partner. I'm going to be keeping his name anonymous for privacy reasons. I had just come home late from work. It was about midnight or so when I had gotten home, and my family was already asleep. My boyfriend was still awake and waiting for me, though. After getting out of my work clothes and into my PJs, him and I were relaxing with our cat when she started crying about wanting to go outside. I couldn't let her out the back door, though, since I'd heard some dogs outside. It was about 2 a.m. or so. She just kept yapping and pawing at the door, so I decided to let her out the front door instead. She's an indoor and an outdoor cat. She only goes outside a few times a week, though. She mostly likes to socialize with other cats or just roam around. I had opened the front door and walked out with her for a brief minute. As she walked out, I noticed she was staring out at the street behind our cars, out of the neighboring street. She kept walking, but then bolted the other way. I suddenly heard this weird grunting. I looked over and saw a figure of a man who I didn't know. He was dirty with messy hair, and he just wore a pair of jeans and a brown jacket. I saw him start approaching the door, and without saying anything, I started to back away, still facing him. As I reached the doorway, I noticed he began to walk a little faster toward me. I got inside just in time, and locked the door behind me. I then heard what I imagined was him trying to open it. The doorknob wiggled violently, then it went quiet. I could still hear some shuffling from outside. Luckily, I had my phone on me so I texted my boyfriend and told him what was going on. I then called my mom, waking her up, because I wasn't sure if her window was open that night, since her room was at the front of the house. This was way before we had any guns in the home, mind you. This happened to be occurring on the one night my father was out of town for a work project. After my mom woke up, she came out into the living room, and since we were both there, we felt it was safe to check out the window. We could see that the guy was still there. My mom jumped back away from the window, as I guess the man had made eye contact with her. We then saw a silhouette as the man began trying to peek into the house. He still wasn't saying anything, just mumbling and pacing around our door. My boyfriend came out with whatever he could find to use as a weapon, just in case it was needed. My mom called the police, explaining what I had told her, as well as what she had just experienced. The man was trying his best to peer inside our house. The cops then said they were sending out a patrol car to us. By the time the cops got to our house, though, the guy had managed to leave without making a sound. The cops showed up, and I gave them a full description of the man, and told them anything I could remember. They decided to drive around a bit to see if they could find the man, down the street or anywhere in between, maybe even hiding around the outer areas of the house. It was all clear, thankfully. There were no other issues or anything going on that night, nor did the man ever come back. My cat eventually returned when they felt like it. I know this may not be that scary to a lot of you, but it was for me. I have my cat to thank, really, because I don't think I would have even realized there was a person there since it was so dark, and I didn't see him or even become aware of him until I was already headed back into the house. All I can say is stay safe out there and try to be aware of your surroundings. We've also gotten a new litter box and some toys, so my cat doesn't feel the need to wander out so much. I think it's much safer that way. In 2019, I did deliveries for a pizza place near my school. I'd work most days after class, so I could afford to pay for my car and rent. It wasn't a great job in any aspect, but it was good enough to get me through college without being completely broke. This night was no different than most in the beginning. I clocked in at 6 o'clock and delivered for three hours straight. Then I took my lunch break and started again at 9.30. I picked up the next order and started heading to the place. 
The address didn't look like a house, and the route it took me on to get there was not what I was expecting. It took me further out from town, away from most houses and stores, into this business center. It was an area full of small office buildings and absolutely nothing else. I drove down the road and couldn't really tell what any of the addresses were. I just followed the directions on the GPS and hoped it would take me into the right parking lot. When I turned, I drove in through a pretty long parking area until I reached the front of the building and could finally read the address. It matched up with the one on the order, but something was wrong here. The parking lot was completely empty, not even the street lights were on, and the office building had no signs of anyone being inside. I double-checked the address, thinking there must have surely been some sort of mistake, but everything checked out. I even tried searching it on Google for any places nearby with the same address, but no, this was it. I set my car in park and got out, glancing around before walking up to the door. It was a glass door with a dark tint covering it. I knocked and then took a step back and waited. It only took a moment before the door opened. There was a middle-aged man there, wearing some very casual clothes and holding a strange grin on his face. He was almost overly excited. He said he was so happy the food had finally arrived and that everyone was so hungry. I looked behind him, not seeing anyone else inside. Not seeing anyone else inside. There was only a single light on in the middle of the hallway, but I ignored everything and just told the man his total. He must have realized what I was looking for, though, as he quickly explained that everyone else was in the rec room on the third floor for a company party. I smiled to be polite, but the man was talking with an eerie amount of excitement, so much so that I was sure the man was faking it. He pulled out his wallet and handed me the cash for the pizzas, along with a $10 tip. As I took the money, though, he said that he needed a favor real quick. He wanted me to help bring the pizzas up to the third floor. The man had put me in a strange position. Having taken the generous tip already, it felt like it would only be right to help him. On the other hand, though, carrying a few pizzas is not exactly difficult, and it didn't seem necessary by any means. He started walking without me having answered, yet urged me to follow him. He made his way to a door leading to some stairs. I trailed behind, keeping my distance, but followed him into the stairwell. As I entered, though, I felt a cold rush of air and noticed that all of the lights were off. Only the small light from the hallway lit the entrance to the stairs. The man started making his way up, but stopped once he realized I hadn't continued following him. He turned and made some humorous remark about the lights, but his grin was quick to leave once he saw I was not going to follow him anymore. There was no hesitation, as he came rushing down toward me with anger in his eyes. I tossed the pizzas on the ground and rushed out the door into the hallway. I then ran for the exit and bolted to my car. I saw the man come partly out the front doors. Before going back in and slamming them shut, I immediately called the police after driving to a different parking lot. The man had run off by the time they got there. Since he'd paid in cash, there was no way to know who he really was. The office building was completely empty, though, and there was nobody else on the third floor, unsurprisingly. It was clear this was some sort of trap. What he had ready for me on that third floor is unknown, and I hope that nobody ever has to know. This happened when I was a high school student, during the summer holidays. My friends and I wanted to make some memories, so we decided to have a barbecue. We set up our barbecue in a field. One of my friends mentioned that there was an abandoned hospital nearby. Because I'd never been ghost hunting or anything like that, he asked if I was up for checking out the abandoned hospital. We were all pumped up for some late night urban exploration. We went to inspect the place at around 11pm. 
I don't know how long ago the hospital was built, but it was really old, and it was practically crumbling down in some places. We approached the entrance cautiously, and my friend told us, Hey guys, it's easy if we go in a big group, but that's so boring. Let's split up a bit. We split up into two groups of three. The first group were ready to go in. Then, after a little while, the second group was set to go in as well. I was in the first group. The atmosphere even in the entrance was so heavy. I don't know if you know what I mean. My heart was thundering in my chest. We tried to open the doors, but it seemed they were locked. I thought that maybe we could break the door down if we tried, but the other lads didn't fancy that. I decided to look around the perimeter for a weak spot to gain access. I found that one of the walls had collapsed around the back side, and I could see inside the building. I let the others in my group know, and we decided to go in. It was really humid in there. The air was moist and damp. It was the usual stuff you would expect to find in an abandoned hospital. Some syringes, some random equipment. The walls were covered in scribblings, and they didn't really make much sense. There were beds as well in the hallways, and something was placed on top of one of these beds, some twisted shape beneath a black cloth. It really creeped me out. I also noticed that someone had strewn origami cranes around the place. I thought about why they might be there. Maybe someone had put there for some reason I didn't understand. Needless to say, it was extremely weird. We crept through even further into the property until we came upon a room with a closed door. I pushed it open, and that's when we saw it. There was this strange doll in front of something resembling an altar. It looked like a crude offering. The doll was quite big and was tattered and raggedy. We went closer to it. None of us wanted to be the one to chicken out and say, let's get out of here but I could tell my friends all wanted to get out of there just as much as I did. There was this cup in front of the doll, and there were some leaves in the cup, as well as a green plate with some black, bad-smelling thing on it. I looked into the doll's eyes. In that moment, I felt a fear of terror for some reason. I knew we had to get out of there immediately. We went back to the barbecue area and started to pack all our things away. I called one of my friends in the second group to see how they were getting on back at the barbecue. When we got back, my friends and I didn't say anything for a while. That was until one of them piped up. Man, that altar was really weird and messed up, huh? I really hated it. It gave me such a weird feeling. I replied that it looked like an offering of some kind. When we discussed our findings, we all saw the doll in the first group but apparently the second group had also gone in for a moment, and no one saw the doll. We wondered if in some of the other rooms there might be some other weird offerings or altars. It was honestly the strangest place I'd ever been in. The next week, all three of us who saw that strange doll ended up with an injury. I broke my finger in P.E., my friend got into a moped accident and broke his toe, and my other friend got into an accident as well. He was in the hospital for days. A teacher asked us while laughing, What's happened to you three? Were you cursed or something? Now, I don't know if I believe in curses myself, but it certainly seemed like no laughing matter after such an eerie occult experience. Even to this day, that abandoned hospital still stands. It hasn't been demolished yet, but a sign that reads Keep Out has since been put up, and a large metal fence surrounds it as well. One thing's for sure, I don't think I'll be looking around in there anytime soon. This happened just last year. I was driving home and making a relatively long drive. It was going to take me about four hours. I was also driving a majority of it at night. I had the directions on my phone and had it in my phone holder right in front of me and slightly to the right. As I was driving at night, I was listening to lots of music and not really paying attention. I had been driving on one really long highway for over an hour. 
In the process, I accidentally missed the exit I was supposed to take that would have led me onto another highway. Instead, I was going in the wrong direction for about 30 minutes. When I finally realized my mistake, the directions were telling me to get off the highway. I then had to take a bunch of back roads to connect to the proper one that I needed to go on. This was supposed to be the shortest route, but it was going through seemingly the middle of nowhere. By this time, the roads were obviously extremely dark and quiet. I didn't see any other cars out on the roads. It was particularly quiet. I was going pretty slow, and after driving on that road for about a mile, my directions told me to turn left. After making the turn, I instantly saw somebody lying on the road up ahead. It appeared to be a man laying on his side, facing away from my vehicle. That was a strange sight indeed. Right away, I was suspicious of this. He was like directly in the middle of the road and was blocking anyone from being able to go past. The man wasn't moving. I just wanted to get out of there, but the possibility the man might actually need help rung in my mind. I stopped my car a ways back from him. On one side of me was some woods, and on the other side was a grassy area with a few trees here and there. There was hardly any light at all aside from my car's headlights. As my car was sitting there on the road, I wanted to see if the man was okay, but I also didn't want to get out either. I rolled down my window and yelled out, asking if the man was alright. He didn't move or say anything. I then decided to call the police. I took my phone out from the holder and started to dial 911. As I was looking down at my phone and doing so though, something caught the corner of my eye. I looked over and saw a man emerging from the woods and going right towards my car. When I saw this, I then saw the man who had been lying on the road start to get up. It was a trap. I knew it. I put my car into reverse and floored it. I started reversing and moving away from these guys. Obviously, I was not well versed in moving away at high speeds in reverse. I wasn't really going that fast, and it was kind of hard to control my car going backwards. I couldn't really see where I was going either. The men were both chasing after me, and they were almost catching up. When I made it back to the turn that I had come around, I put a distance between us and then slammed on my brakes and turned. I was then facing the direction of a new road. The men almost caught up to me when I was stopped for a second, but I was able to drive away just before they reached me. I got out of there and then called the police when I was a distance away from them. I gave the exact location of where the incident occurred. Then I took another route to where I needed to go. I hoped that the police found those guys, or they didn't try whatever it was someplace else. I made it back home a little later than I'd hoped that night, but at least I made it back safe and sound, and that's what matters. When I was in middle school, I took the city bus to my school because my parents couldn't drive me and no school buses routed to my neighborhood. I didn't live in a particularly good place, but I never really felt unsafe either, probably because I was just a kid and thought myself invincible. That morning, I got on the bus to go to school. I was in sixth grade at the time, so I was about 12 years old. Let me tell you though, I've always looked much younger than my age. It was decently crowded inside, so I went to my usual spot right in the back. A few stops went by when a man got on and sat right next to me. It's been about 10 years now, but I still remember how that man looked. He was tall, thin, with long, straight black hair. There were maybe one or two seats open, so it wasn't that weird that he'd sat right down next to me. At first, I just figured he sat in the first available seat he saw open. Then, though, he started to talk to me. I can't really remember what he was saying at first. Being early in the morning and already pissed I had to share my space with him, I just sort of made vaguely disinterested noises at him. 
He then asked where I was going. That's when my spidey senses started to tingle. Obviously, it was early in the morning, and I was a child. Where else could I be going other than to school? I said school in a duh kind of way. I realize now he was probably looking for me to tell him which school. A few stops went by, and the bus opened up more. I went and found another empty seat. Not five minutes later, he followed and plopped down right next to me. He still tried to get me to talk to him. He asked me my name as well. I looked to the front of the bus and saw some 8th graders that I was familiar with from school and from riding this bus. My animal brain screamed at me to find safety within the pack, so I moved up to the front of my bus and planted myself right into the middle of them. I basically pressed myself right into them and gave them the big help me eyes. The guy moved again and sat directly in front of me. He asked my name once more. One of the boys I was sitting with, named G, quickly called me by a fake name and turned his body so he was kind of shielding me. He carried on a conversation with me until we got to our school. The group of 8th graders basically formed a circle around me and we huddled off the bus together. I turned to make sure the creep didn't follow us off the bus and thankfully he did not. For the next few weeks though, I always caught the earlier or later bus just in case he was on it again. Since the bus stop was right in front of my school, I was afraid he would know where I went and would show up there to find me, but I never saw that guy again. I'm extremely grateful those kids were there to help me. I don't know if that guy might have thought I was younger than I looked, or maybe he thought I was just young and stupid enough to trust him with personal information. Either way, I'm glad he didn't get to do whatever he was planning. This happened six years ago, on the last day of August. I had just come back from spending the summer at my home and was gearing up for another year of school. My girlfriend and I drove back from the airport and were coming into the student complex where we lived. Standing outside smoking was this man, Toby. Neither of us liked Toby very much. He'd been living in the downstairs apartments last year and had been really creepy to one of our floor mates named Sarah. So creepy, in fact, that he had to be banned from the upper floors entirely. We mostly were able to ignore him after that. Toby, however, never let a chance to socialize pass him by, so he said hello and told us we couldn't get inside because the doorknob was missing. It was quite strange, but the building was only renovated into a student complex the year before, and it was kind of a trashy place, so the doorknob being missing was not something unheard of. I looked around for it and put the doorknob back on. Toby wandered down toward the end of the walkway to yell obscenities down the street at someone. That was a bit worrying. Even though Toby was kind of creepy, he'd never been a violent or overly aggressive sort of person. He was more subtle in his ways. We slipped inside, thinking that he must have been drunk. We settled in to go to bed, since my plane had gotten in late, and it was around midnight or so. We tried to sleep, but it turned out that was impossible. For whatever reason, Toby was in a rage outside. He was yelling and screaming. He kept coming in and out of the home, banging doors and stomping around. Now, most people had moved out at the end of the year, and we were not even sure if Toby still lived there anymore. We decided, you know, whatever, he'll tire himself out eventually, and it's not like he's hurting anyone. We just tried our best to ignore it. About an hour and a half later, though, Toby was still in a furious rage. Now he was outside our window, though. We were on the side of the building that's next to the other building. The building next door was when they were turning into more student complexes. Toby was banging against the chain link fence, swearing about his house or something, right outside our window. At this point, my girlfriend and I were becoming concerned for our safety. The yelling and banging were getting more and more violent and showed absolutely no signs of stopping. We went and made sure the doors were locked, 
and called the police just in case. The police took a while to arrive, but they arrested Toby for disturbing the peace. They had a talk with him to tell him to quiet down and go to bed. They came and talked with my girlfriend, who'd called them initially, and they left telling us to call back if things kept up or got worse. That was the end of it, we thought, for about 15 minutes anyway. Everything was quiet. When Toby discovered we'd locked the doors, he was not happy about that. He started screaming obscenities, yelling this is my house over and over. He went back to beating on the chain link fence and screaming at people across the street. Then there was a brief silence, followed by the sound of shattering glass. Toby threw a rock and broke one of the windows in the room next to ours. Had he been one window over, it would have gone straight into our room. We called the police again, now worried that Toby was escalating even further. Luckily for us, however, Toby seemed to have scared himself and stopped throwing rocks at windows after that. The banging against the front and back doors and the chain link fence didn't stop though, not until the police came and took him away for good. We saw him a few days later. We learned that he did in fact not even live there anymore. He was sitting on the grass by the driveway on the phone and gave us the most menacing look when we got out of the car. Luckily, I haven't seen him since, and I'll be happy if I never run into him again.